Hey, Crossover family, here are your announcements. Our summer schedule has begun for our Wednesday night Emmaus Experience Bible study. Last Wednesday night, our women kicked it off with Jonah navigating a life interrupted. They'll continue for the next six weeks. This coming Wednesday night, our men will kick off their book study at 7 p.m. through a Zoom session. Make sure you tune in. Good evening. Welcome to the CBF Wise Guys Spring and Summer Men's Ministry Bible Study Series, featuring the best of Manifest. Over the next six weeks, you will be taken on a virtual journey as we look at six notable biblical men whose lives took on many twists and turns on their journey. One may say, they experienced the worst of circumstances. Our region youth and our crossed over kids will also conduct their Bible studies on Wednesday nights. As usual, we have something for the entire family. But don't worry, we're transitioning to our highly anticipated new summer Wednesday curriculum called LIT. LIT stands for Life and Transformation. And this summer, our main topic we will attack is godly purpose. You don't want your kids to miss out on any of these lessons. It will be filled with engaging lessons, great gospel music, interactive videos, purpose parodies, and weekly challenges, and even more. This curriculum will be tailored to our K through second and third through six groups, but we will also have lessons for our toddlers. We have changed our format to make it easier for your kids to engage without your assistance, but we would still like for you to check and see what they've learned. Be on the lookout this Wednesday as Lit goes live. For the time being, we're still conducting our weekly prayer calls held on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays at various times each day. We look forward to you joining us. Hey, family and friends. I'd like to take this time to welcome our crossover members as well as our digital community as we get ready to worship God in our Sunday service. We continue our series just for you as we cover the life of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and his many miraculous encounters with people. For now, we ask that you join in with us for our praise and worship team, led by Elder Artis Wilson. Thank you. 
Crossover family, we thank you. I hope everything's well. Uh, we thank you for the gifts that you have given us, uh, your partnering with us in ministry. It continues to allow us to uh, bless some folks locally as well as globally, uh, touching people through missions, touching people through the local ministry here. And so it allows for us to do some great things, uh, allows for us to do our online uh, ministry. And so we thank you so much for that. You have, uh, you have done well, and the Lord has been so kind to us. And so uh, we just continue to ask, uh, ask you to um, make your way to the different avenues that we have to give. We've tried to make it as convenient as possible. And also we want to still emphasize the uh, COVID-19 relief fund. Uh, continue to give to that, put a portion in that uh, so that we might be able to bless some folks, uh, people who have been furloughed, lost jobs, and those kind of things. Again, we thank you so much and we love you. Uh, one day we're going to get back together again and we'll be able to uh, celebrate our Lord together physically. But until then, uh, we just ask and pray that uh, you remain safe and uh, God bless. Welcome to Crossover Bible Fellowship Online Worship Experience, where we focus on teaching people the Word of God and touching people with the love of God. We are excited you have joined us and want you to know we are praying for each of you and your families. We do not take for granted your stopping in to get to know God or to grow in His Word. We believe these messages are life transforming. For those of you who frequently join us, we are overjoyed that you regularly benefit from these encounters. We welcome you to partner with us as you see fit by investing in this ministry so we can continue to make disciples of all nations. Please click the link below at any time to become a digital disciple and grow with us. Now sit back and prepare to hear the life-changing, life-transforming Word of God. Crossover family and friends, it's good to be with you again. Hope everyone is doing well. Hope everyone is uh, staying safe. And since we're having to be home a lot, I hope everyone's cooking and eating well. Uh, it has been a long time since we've seen each other, and uh, we definitely miss you. Uh, we continue to pray for you and your family, and I would hope you would pray for me and mine. Um, looking forward to that time we can all get back together again. Uh, we thank God for um, Pastor Blake Wilson and um, what the Lord placed on his heart with this series, Just For You. Uh, this is the third message in that series. Uh, Consider it an honor to follow uh, Pastor Blake and uh, Brother Jamon. And so um, in this third message, we are going to be looking at Mark chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. Mark chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. So if you will open your Bibles, we'll read from the Word of God. And it reads as follows. As he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus sitting in the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And it happened that he was reclining at the table in his house, and many tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many of them, and they were following him. When the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, why is he eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? And hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Let's bow our head for a word of prayer. Father God, it is um, just good knowing that we're in your care. Lord, you are a, a good father. You are a, a strong and mighty tower. And Lord, in these trying times that we are going through right now, it's good to know that you're in control. Lord, I pray for the hurting. I pray for those who may have sickness in their bodies. Lord, I'm praying, uh, Lord, that you would touch them with your finger of love. Lord, if they may be sick, we pray healing for them. Lord, to those that may be hurting right now, we pray your comfort and peace. Lord, your word is uh, of utmost importance to this body. And, uh, Lord, we need it in order to... Uh, please you and what we do. We find wisdom in it. We find comfort in it. And so, Lord, I thank you that uh, you have given this to us for us to know more about you, to get to know you better, that we might please you. Again, we thank you so much for uh, sending us Jesus Christ, uh, the sinless one who uh, went to the cross and died for our sins. We deserve none of it, but that's, uh, that's just what grace is all about. And so we thank you for that. And looking forward to what you're going to do uh, through the message. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We want to speak from a topic today of just for those 
who never get invited to the party, just for those who never get invited to the party. Uh, my wife and I, we've got two boys, Colton and Langston, both 10 and 13. And now that they're both in double digits, we are transitioning out of elementary school into junior high, soon to be high school. And so uh, Langston's going to fifth grade. He's going to be the big man on campus. And so we've seen that elementary school life. And one thing about parenting in elementary school versus the times when you went, things are a little different than when you went. Uh, one of those things is birthdays. Elementary school, birthdays are a big deal. Um, you, if, if you're going to bring cake and cupcakes and, and donuts, you got to make sure everybody in the classroom has one. If you're going to bring uh, anything uh, that's going to celebrate that child, you got to make sure everybody in the classroom gets one. And so um, the same thing goes with uh, parties. If your child's going to have a birthday party, they got to make sure everybody in the classroom gets an invitation. Somebody along the way thought it was wise to make sure every kid in the class gets that invitation because it's a hurting feeling when you're the one left out. And so uh, that was how it was when I was ele in elementary school. Whoever was your friend and whoever you were cool with, that's who got the invitation. But now you got to have it for everybody because when you're the one left out, that's a hurting feeling. Uh, you feel like you're less than everybody else. You feel like you've been left out and uh, even as adults now, we can kind of relate to those same feelings because we do things to each other to ostracize one another and separate one another and, and isolate ourselves from one, one another. How do we do that? Well, we do that with the isms, uh, classism, racism. Don't let somebody make a mistake. We shun them for that. Disagreements, oh, man. That happens in families. We get separated from family members because we have one disagreement and we find ourselves far and distant from them. And so whenever we become isolated, whenever we become ostracized, whenever we become outcast, there's a, a hurting feeling that comes along with that. And so there's a couple of responses that people have to that kind of feeling. Some people, they become callous. You know, they're like, hey, you don't want me to be a part of the group? That's cool. I didn't want to be a part of the group anyway. So they're callous and they're hardened, hardening their hearts. And in the same time, you got some people who uh, uh, fall into depression. Oh, you don't like me? You don't want me to be part of a group? Well, how come they don't want me, man? Well, then they go into depression and they uh, find themselves losing heart and feeling undesirable. And so many of us take these, uh, these feelings from being physically ostracized and oftentimes it has a spiritual impact on us. And so we feel unworthy for God's love and we feel undesirable to God and, and we feel like we can't ever be in fellowship with God's people. But what I want to do today in today's message is to let you know those feelings are untrue and they're non-biblical. Our story today should change your mind about that. All you have to do as we look in chapter 2 of Mark in verses 14 through 17, we're going to be talking about Matthew and in Mark, it says Levi. So please forgive me. I'll be saying Matthew and Levi all the time during the message. But it's about the calling of Levi. He's a, uh, a tax collector, a publican. And those guys were hated back then. But yet here it is in this story. Jesus Christ sees him sitting in his tax booth. And Jesus says, follow me. That's somebody who was hated. But yet Jesus still said, follow me. And so in the same way, you who are feeling that way, all you have to do is simply put yourself in Matthew's shoes, see yourself in the story of Matthew, and you'll come to know that you should never feel too far from God's love and that you should never feel like you could never be in fellowship with God's people because God is inviting all of us. And so I've uh, broke this uh, message out into four sections. I'm seeing um, uh, this here. I'm seeing Jesus, uh, number one in the first section. I'm seeing in verse uh, 14, Jesus sees us. And then in verse 14, I'm also seeing how Jesus invites us. And then uh, in, in verse 15, I'm seeing that Jesus identifies with us. And then lastly, in verse 16 and 17, I'm seeing how Jesus protects us. If you look in uh, Luke chapter uh, 15, I believe, there's the story of the lost sheep and how the shepherd goes and retrieves that lost sheep. Well, these points kind of walk through the good shepherd's process of getting that lost sheep. He sees that lost sheep. And the invitation is just like the good shepherd taking that staff and retrieving that lost sheet and, and pulling it in. That's the invitation. 
And when that lost sheep comes in, that shepherd is going to address any wounds or any injuries that that sheep has. And so that's the same thing that Jesus does as he identifies with us. And then lastly, when he brings that sheep into the fold with the other sheep, he's going to protect that sheep. And so that's kind of how we've got this outline of this is that Jesus is our good shepherd. And so as we walk through the story of Matthew, we want to talk firstly about Jesus seeing us. So in verse 14, it says that um, as he passed by, so it gives us a picture of Jesus being in action. Jesus is doing something. This is early in Jesus's earthly ministry. Jesus just previously in the story had healed the paralytic. And so Jesus is off and running in his ministry. He's working and Jesus is focused on fulfilling his purpose. He's got the end game of going to the cross. He says uh, in the Gospels that I came to ransom myself for many. And so he's got the end game of the cross. He said, I came to save the world. But he also has the mid game of serving and preaching. He says, I've got to preach the good news of the kingdom. And he says, I came to serve. And also during his time on earth, there's all of these prophecies that went on in the Old Testament. And so everything he does is fulfilling all of those prophecies. So you have Jesus focused in on his message, focused in on his mission. And here it is. He sees Matthew. Jesus Christ, the son of God, focused on his ministry, going headed straight to the cross, doing everything good. And he still sees Matthew. I don't know about y'all. Whenever you watched um, a Mike Tyson fight, there was always this great anticipation. Tyson's about to get somebody real good. He's about to tear somebody up. And so before the fight would start, you know, you would have that march in. And so you would have Mike Tyson coming in and he would have that towel where they cut that hole in it. And he would put that over his head, and, and then he would have those leather boots with no socks on. And whenever Mike Tyson was walking to the, uh, to the ring, he might, you know, shift his, his head a little bit, might throw a couple of jabs. But one thing you never saw Mike Tyson do, as he's focused on the match and as he's focused on his opponent, opponent you never saw Mike Tyson stop, look over in the crowd and say, hey, hey, Jimmy, won't you come on? We got some water bottles back there. Pick those up and walk in this ring with me. But here it is, Jesus Christ, as he's fulfilling his purpose that God calls for him, and he's headed towards the cross doing everything that he's supposed to be doing, he sees Matthew. And so that's a, a, a testimony to us that Jesus sees us. And so we, we see that Jesus is on a mission, but also Jesus sees us in the condition that we're in. Whenever we feel isolated and forgotten us, we often wonder, does God care? And the answer is yes. And we can see that because it says that Jesus saw Le Levi sitting in the tax booth. Now, when you hear that word that he was sitting in the tax booth, it kind of reminds you of Psalms 1. Remember, uh, it tells you, um, not walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. That's walking, standing, sitting, that progression of sin. First you walk past the sin, then you stop and notice the sin, and the next thing you know, you're sitting and, and, and neck deep in the sin. And so when you see the text saying that Matthew was sitting in the tax collector's booth, that's an ugly position. Matthew is in the midst of his sin. And so it kind of puts you in the mind of the verse that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We were caught up in our sins and, and, and Christ saw that we were in the midst of our sins, but yet and still he died for us. So this is an ugly look that Matthew has right now, and yet Jesus still notices him. And so uh, when we talk about the process of, of Matthew becoming a tax collector, we understand how he becomes his own worst enemy and how he became to the place where he's hated amongst the people. As a tax collector, he would be considered a sellout. As a tax collector, he would be considered a thief. He would be considered a liar. He would be considered unclean. Uh, Matthew has, has burned a lot of bridges. See, as a, uh, a tax collector, you are now working for the Roman government, and they were oppressing the Jewish people. And here it is, Levi, a Jew, is working for the Roman government to oppress his own people. So he was a sellout. And he was a thief and a liar because as they took in those taxes, they would add a little bit more just so they could have a little bit something for themselves that they could put in their own pocket. So he would give incorrect information to get higher taxes, and he would take that money. So that would make him a liar and a thief. And then finally, they were considered unclean by the religious leaders of that day. 
And so, therefore, Matthew is the most hated or one of the most hated people in Jewish culture. And yet Jesus still sees him. And so all of this stuff that isolates Matthew were personal choices that he made. He burned his own bridges. And so if we're honest with ourselves, oftentimes, whenever we're in those positions of being uh, isolated, when we feel like we're uh, apart, far from God, oftentimes it's because of self-inflicted wounds. Oftentimes it's because of poor decisions that we made. Our suffering in isolation could it just simply be from our poor choices. Think about those career choices that you made. You put a priority on, on your job. You put a priority on making money. And, and, and you had all the right intentions, but when you put that as the priority, now the kids took, a second, took second base. The kids took second place. And so as a result of that, now you're distant from your kids. Or, or, or maybe it was a relationship that you picked over the previous relationships that you had with your family members, and they were trying to warn you of a mistake. Now, because you indulged in that, you're now isolated, separated from people because of the very things that you did on your very own. And so Matthew here is suffering in isolation really because of what he's done, and yet and still Jesus sees him. And so it tells us in, in verse 14 that uh, Matthew is the son of Alphaeus. And so Jesus not only sees uh, Levi in the condition that he's in, but he also knows the cause of the condition. We bring up uh, Levi being the son of Alphaeus because that lets us know that Levi is all man. He's not like Jesus where Jesus is all man and all God, but Jesus, uh, Levi is all man. So therefore, he is sinful and he's got a condition that's causing him to do all of the things that he's doing. Matthew is in need of Jesus because of his condition. Some of our isolation is because our inability to turn away from some of the sins that we're doing. Have you ever found yourself in a position where you, you've committed a sin, you, you, you've done some things, and you're like, man, this is, I, I hate what this is doing for me, but you never can stop what it is that you're doing. It's because we all have this condition inside, and it's called sin. In Matthew 5, 12, it says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sin. So our sinful state leaves us separated from God. And our separation for God, from God leaves us empty and unfulfilled. That's where those feelings come from. We're empty and unfulfilled because we're not able to do and fulfill the purpose that God has for us. We are created in the image of God. And as created in the image of God, it was our duty and our purpose to bring glory to God. And so whenever we're not living out our purpose, whenever we're not fulfilling our purpose, we find ourselves hurting because we're not operating in our purpose. Whenever you see, uh, when we're not operating in our purpose, it's like a fish outside of water. Whenever you see a bird, the most beautiful birds is the ones when they're flying in the air and you see them flapping those wings and they're climbing to their peak and then they just spread those wings out and they're just kind of gliding in the sky. That's the most beautiful look on a bird. Nobody thinks that the bird on the ground is beautiful. The bird on the ground, whenever you think about a bird that's on the ground, it always ends up on somebody's plate with a biscuit. And so with the, just like the fish and just like those birds, sin is the exact same way. Whenever we find ourselves locked in sin, that sin then consumes us. So Jesus looks upon Matthew, looks upon Matthew, sees him in his sin, knows his condition, and still he says, follow me. Still, he says, follow me. So that leads us to the next, uh, next uh, point. Jesus invites us in verse 14. So Jesus sees us, and he also, he invites us. And the first thing we see is he invites us to be involved with his mission. Matthew receives an invitation from God in the flesh. We can't emphasize this point anymore. We can't, there, there's not enough times to emphasize the fact that Jesus Christ, all man, all God, invites Matthew to be involved in something that he's doing. My family, we went to um, Washington, D.C. For, um, for the second inauguration of the Obama administration. 
And so we there, we went to some of the museums, we went to some of the different things. Uh, me and, and, and Langston had to leave early because of my job, so we didn't get to go to the parade. But during that time there, no one ever called my phone from the CIA and said, uh, Barack Obama asked you to, uh, to come to this event. And, and no one during the parade stopped the limousine and allowed Michelle to get out and say, hey, Dawn, why don't you and Colton come on, hop in the limousine and be with us? Because we're not on that level to be invited to that kind of thing. But here it is, Jesus invites Matthew to be along with him. He says, follow me in the text. Now, in the text, that follow me is directly for Matthew. But when we see follow me, Jesus is making that same invitation to all of us. Jesus saw Matthew as one who could be his vessel. See, whenever you have a, um, a computer printer, and that computer printer isn't hooked up to a computer, that printer is worthless. Or if you got a car, it can have all the right parts. It can have all the working parts. But if that car doesn't have a battery, it's worthless. So when Jesus looks upon Matthew, he looks upon Matthew with a spiritual eye. And he sees that Matthew can be used for his glory if Matthew is hooked up with him. And so he makes the invitation for Matthew to come and be a part of him. I don't know if you have ever watched those, uh, those shows on the DIY network or HGTV where if somebody throws an old couch or somebody throws a, um, some old decorative stuff on their uh, front yard for somebody to come pick up. And so the individual will come and they see that, that, that couch and they'll grab it. And they'll take it back to their lab, back to their uh, production facility. And they'll reupholster to that couch. And so the couch was torn up, had spots all over it. But after they got finished with it, that couch was brand new and worthy to be in somebody's house. And so in the same way, Jesus takes us in all of our filthiness and he cleans us up and he makes us worthy to be serving him for his glory and on his mission. So Jesus is calling Matthew to an upgraded life. What he was doing was just empty living. But just like Jesus called the previous disciples, he says, uh, as they were fishing, I'll make you fishers of men. Meaning when Jesus calls for us to follow him, he is calling us to an upgraded life where he's making us into something great for his glory. So following Christ, it involves sacrifice, but the rewards are far greater than what we have right now. And so with Christ, it's not a question of whether you're worthy. It's not a question of your unworthiness. None of us are worthy. But it's a question of willingness. He's worthy, but are you willing to follow? He's making that invitation. Are you willing to say yes to what he's inviting you to? So he invites us to be involved in his mission. And he also invites us to make an exchange of our troubles. In verse uh, 14 again, it says that Matthew got up. And he followed him. And if you look at this story in Luke's gospel, it says that he left everything, got up, and followed Jesus. Uh, when, he, when it says that he left everything, Matthew has laid his burdens down. Matthew's swift response shows how valuable he viewed the things in his life. He viewed Jesus more valuable than the stuff that he already had. When Matthew sacrificed it pales in comparison to what he's gained. What Matthew gave up doesn't even compare to what Jesus has given us. Whenever we look at Matthew, he gave up his riches. If he's a tax collector, we know that he's rich. But when you think about it, the sacrifice of the riches is pretty big. But the fact that he's able to set aside all of the bad stuff that comes along with being a tax collector is far greater than giving up the money. And that's what he's taken on. He's given up all of the suffering, the shame, and all of the strife that comes with being a tax collector and now has taken on all of the good things that comes with being a disciple. And so Matthew was able to leave because he was convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. And Matthew was able to leave because what he was being offered is something better than what we have. Whenever we think of criminals, like a drug dealer or, or, or even a money launderer, we always would think of them as fools. Why would you risk your livelihood, your life? Why would you risk the opportunity to gain money knowing that there's a possibility 
that you would go to prison. We would all look at those type of people as fools. But here it is. We romanticize sin in the same way, just like Eve romanticized the apple. She didn't think about the, the, the ramifications of eating that apple. And in the same way, we romanticize sin, relationships, career. We talked about them earlier. All of that stuff we choose, but we don't ever think about all of the ramifications of us making those selections. We romanticize sin in everything that we do. Jesus is making that invitation, but yet and still, we've got other things that we think about because we romanticize them, not thinking about the fact that those things are actually hurting us and causing destruction in our lives. And so we accept suffering for sin for temporary rewards. And so we see that Jesus sees us. We see that he invites us. And then we see that he identifies with us. In verse 15, we see that uh, we get to fellowship with Christ. In verse 15, we see uh, the tax collectors and sinners. They're all sitting with the disciples. They're sharing a meal with the disciples. And so uh, Jesus identifies our need for his acceptance. He identifies our need for his acceptance. It says many sinners were following Jesus and his disciples, and they attend a party with them. Now, no one would ever eat with tax collectors and sinners because those guys were considered low class. No one would ever spend their time in their presence. Meals back in those days re reinforced social values, and so sinners were not accepted in society. You would want to eat with somebody that was on your level or somebody that was a level up. You don't want to eat with tax collectors and sinners. They were low class. But Jesus introduces a come-as-you-are invitation when it comes to a meal. His acceptance it equals understanding. That's his compassion towards us. In Matthew 11 and 28, it says, come unto me, all who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So as we follow Jesus, we share the same seat at the table. He's inviting us. He gives us his acceptance. We are a welcome guest at the table with him. So we see that he identifies our need for acceptance, and also Jesus identifies our need for forgiveness. It says that Jesus was reclining at the table with the tax collectors and sinners. Tax collectors and sinners were considered unclean because of their non-adherence to the law. And so if someone was unclean, that means they had to be avoided so it wouldn't make you unclean and therefore you couldn't participate in religious rituals. And so tax collectors and sinners were shunned. But Jesus sits at the table with these very folks that they considered unclean. And so it lets us know that Jesus' intention was to clean those people up. And so when we follow Christ, we find forgiveness in him. He, cleans, he cleanses us for us to serve him. And then that unforgive, of unforgiveness leaves us out in the cold, but Jesus invites us to be washed that we might be able to be of service to him. So we get acceptance, we get forgiveness, and then Jesus identifies our need for reconciliation. This is a big one. Tax collectors and sinners were with Jesus and his disciples. Jesus brings a rejected group of people into his fold. So in the old group, when it was just the tax collectors and sinners, they were shunned. They were outside. And so there was pain and anguish. But now Jesus puts the two groups together. So you see the tax collectors and sinners along with Jesus' disciples. The tax collectors and sinners are now amongst the disciples, and now it's good for them to be on the winning team. Believers are reconciled through God, individually through Jesus Christ. And so that reconciliation then allows for us to reconcile with our brother. So where we were far out and distant because of Christ dying with us, we are now connected with God. We have a relationship with him. We have connection with him. And as a result of that connection, we can now reconcile with our brother and sister. Where we felt distant from them, we can now go to them because we both have a common interest in Jesus Christ. And so at the same time, we now want to establish that relationship with one another. And so believers are reconciled through Jesus, and our reconciliation with Jesus allows us to be reconciled with our brother. And then Jesus ident identifies our need for intimacy with him. It says that Jesus, along with those sinners, tax collectors and sinners, were reclined at the table eating. And the table is where information is shared. Conversations are had at the table. 
uh, and, and that situation, the way it would look is they had these tables that were kind of like couch tables uh, is the best description. And so you would lean to the side sort of laying down and put your left elbow down and you would eat with your right hand. So you would kind of be laid out as you enjoy a meal. And so Jesus was reclined at the table showing comfort in the group that he's with. And also the tax collectors and sinners and the disciples, they were all reclined at the table as well. And so they were sharing with Jesus. And so you can imagine that these people who had been beat down by life, now they're at the table and they're being built up again through Jesus, through his words. You can only imagine what they were able to get out of Jesus being at the table with him and what he would talk about. I could imagine that you would probably get some of the things that you got out of the uh, Sermon on the Mount or maybe the Sermon on the Plain. But just to be at the table with Jesus, sitting at his feet and hearing his words and being built up in the same way we now follow Christ and we have the same opportunity to be intimate with him in our lives. So the word of God allows for us to be right there at the table, allowing his words to build us up. So where we were separated and we were in despair, now that we've uh, come to know Christ and the pardon of our sins, we now have a relationship with us and we allow the word of God to build us up and the word renews us and it redefines us and now we find our lives in him. And so Jesus identifies with us. And so we find acceptance, we find forgiveness, we find reconciliation, and we find intimacy with him. And then lastly, in verses 16 and 17, it says Jesus protects us. In verse 16 and 17, we got some visitors called the Pharisees who come and question Jesus, question the disciples about Jesus uh, interacting with tax collectors and sinners. And so we see how Jesus response to this inquiry in verses 16 and 17. So the first thing we're seeing is that Jesus fights off any enemy to the unity of his people. Uh, the Pharisees and the scribes, they approach the disciples and they ask, why is Jesus eating with tax collectors and sinners? Notice that the Pharisees, they don't go, the scribes of the Pharisees don't go to Jesus directly. They go to the disciples and ask that question. So the Pharisees, who were the religious leaders of the day, who were pushing and, and, and praying upon the folks about ceremonial clean, clean, cleanliness, were pushing and forcing the people into rules and regulations, come and ask a question of the disciples about why is Jesus eating with tax collectors and sinners? And so that question is the potential for disunity amongst the body. Jesus has a group that he's put together, and that group of the disciples will be the ones to carry on his ministry. And so that's a living organism that he has to keep together and keep healthy in order for the gospel to be spread. And so Jesus isn't going to allow any disunity in the body. Unity allows the body to grow. We edify one another. We love one another. It's our love for one another that puts the stamp on us that lets the world know that Jesus lives here. And so whenever there's any uh, a trace of disunity, any type of uh, opportunity for disunity, it has to be dealt with. And Jesus deals with it. You remember Paul in Galatians. He chastises Peter when he doesn't eat with the Gentiles. Why? Because that's another opportunity for unity to be broken. And so in the same way, we've got to value unity of the body. We've got a healthy living organism that we've got to protect. And then next we see that Jesus reinforces the value of his people. He reinforces the value of his people. It says uh, Jesus responds to the Pharisees. And he says, it's not the healthy that need a physician, but the sick. And so Jesus' statement validates the presence of the sinners at the table. The tax collectors and sinners that were there, all, Jesus validates their presence. They're supposed to be there. Jesus welcomes them there, and Jesus lets these people know that these are my guests. Jesus doesn't condemn the sinners for their past. And anyone who considers themselves to be sick can be made well. So we got COVID-19 going on, and if anybody has any sort of symptoms, if they cough simply, we want these people away from us. If, if, if I were to come home, cough and dawn would want me away from her. 
But Jesus, totally opposite about what's going on right now, Jesus is looking for sick folks because he's got what they need to be healed. And so we see that Jesus protects his people uh, whenever there's any disunity that's coming along and his protection validates and gives value to the ones who are part of the group because he's letting people know, he's letting the people know that these are my people and they should be here. And so as we close today, we talked earlier about children's parties and how bad they can be whenever you don't get invited. But another way that, that children can hurt one another that we can all relate to is that lunch table. Whenever um, it's lunchtime, we've got all of the tables spread out in the area. Uh, every table's taken up. You see the separation and segregation of all the different groups. So if you're, a diff if you're a new kid and you've never been to that school and you don't have any friends, or if you're beefing with somebody and you've been put out of the group, that's a hurting feeling for you because you're not going to have anywhere to sit. And so whenever you sit down by yourself, it's a hurting feeling. You feel uh, uh, distant from everybody. You feel like, man, uh, nobody uh, wants me there. Do, uh, does anybody care about me? But, man, whenever somebody sees you and they say, hey, 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 everybody's sitting over here, that little wave of the hand, that little invitation to the table, man, that goes a long way because now it says that person cares for me. It says that person is interested in being with me. It says that, in that person is interested in spending time with me. It simply says that that person, I matter to somebody. And so in the same way, Jesus is making that invitation to all of us. He sees you in your sin, and he is inviting you to an upgraded life to become his disciple, to bring glory to him. And as you come into the fold, he's going to protect you, and he's going to uh, show his care and concern about you, and he's going to heal your wounds. He's going to build you up. And if there's anyone that comes and tries to hurt you with your past, he protects you because he cares for you. That's the invitation that we have from Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you so much. Uh, your word is a, a light into our path. Uh, Lord, it leads us to the ways of righteousness. And so, Lord, we thank you for your word. And we thank you uh, for the power of your word, Lord, uh, that it reminds us of the fact that you love us. It reminds us of the fact that you care about us. And it reminds us of the fact that you're inviting us to be a part of what you're doing. Lord, there's, uh, our lives are so empty, and Lord, our lives are, uh, are just void without you. And so we thank you that you've invited us in. And so, Lord, I'm praying for anyone that may feel isolated, anyone that may feel separated, Lord, that this message might bring hope to them, that you're inviting each and every one of us to come and be a part of what you're doing. It's not a... It's not a question of if you're willing, and it's not a question of if we're worthy. It's a question of if we're willing to heed the call. Again, we thank you so much, and, and we love you for life and for health and for strength that you've given us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray it all. Amen. As is customary here at Crossover Bible Fellowship, each first Sunday, we join together as a community, as a church body, and partake of the Lord's Supper. We would do the same today. The Lord's Supper reminds us that we should be thankful for the free gift of God, eternal life. Paul describes this gift as the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is my body, which is broken for you. The picture is one of ultimate service, as Jesus paid the price for our salvation. Paul invites us to remember that sacrifice, that suffering, and that service by participating in communion service also known as the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a time to remember the life of Jesus. We make a mistake if we remember only his death. Yes, we remember the cross, but we also remember a life dedicated to other people. This is why we call the Lord's Supper a celebration. It's a celebration of God's gift of life. John 3.16 reminds us that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He gave his life so that we might have life. This is the perfect model of service. So every time we partake of the Lord's Supper, we remember that Jesus gives life. He offers a new way. He offers a new life. He offers a new beginning. This is not a funeral. The funeral has already taken place. The mourning lasted for only three days. Then came the victory. 
We celebrate the resurrection and the life that comes with it. Paul describes it like this. Thanks be to God. He gives us victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today at the supper, we celebrate life, a life given and a life granted. Prior to taking the Lord's Supper, the Bible encourages us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 28 through 34, to examine ourselves. We will take a moment to do that now, examine our lives, ask God for forgiveness and repent of our sins prior to partaking of the Lord's Supper. At this time, if you've already gathered with your families and you've already uh, gotten your sacraments, your wine or your grape juice and your crackers, then we ask that you would join in with us as we get ready to partake together. I'm going to peel back the layer on my cup. If you have one of these, you can do the same at this time. First Corinthians 11 says this, For I received from the Lord that which I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You may eat. This time we ask that you would get your grape juice. If you have one of these, you can pull back the second layer. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You may drink. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we thank you. Thank you, God, for another opportunity to come together as a community, God, even in these times, to remember the death, burial, and resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ, for our sins. Thank you, God, for sending him. Thank you, God, for him dying on the cross for us. And God, may we live a life that's pleasing to him based on uh, our affiliation with Christ Jesus as our Lord and Savior. May you be pleased with these lives, Father, in the name of Jesus. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Until next time, God bless. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. We hope and pray that you've been encouraged, equipped, challenged, and changed by the Word of God. If you are currently without a church home, we would love for you to be a valuable part of our Crossover Bible Fellowship family. If you are unsure about your relationship with Christ or unclear about how His gospel applies to you, we would be excited to walk with you through what it means to be saved. Simply reach out to us at membership at crossoverbf.com.